word. Today's scripture is from Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The stairs, snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. For this, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you haven't already, please open to Psalm 18 as we continue our summer of Psalms. I had the privilege and the honor of preaching in Kansas City last Sunday, and it was a wonderful time with the saints there. I consumed exactly 7.85 pounds of barbecue. It was glorious, um, but I, I missed you guys. It, it, there's nothing like being home and seeing familiar faces and worshiping with my family. And so, love and miss you, and it is really good for my soul to see you. Very good to look up and see Pastor Jacob Hatfield from Grace Bible Church and his beautiful family as well. He probably doesn't want me to call attention to him, but we pray for him often, and it's good. He's on sabbatical, so he came to visit today, and We've been friends for many years, and so he's probably going to heckle me from the fourth row, but I love you anyway, brother. We're very thankful for the work that God is doing in Monticello, and let's keep praying for them. We have a tiny little psalm to work through today, so let's go ahead and pray. <laughs> You're like, why did they give the long-winded pastor the gigantic psalm? I, I don't know. Let's pray. We have a lot to get through, but by God's grace, we will get there. And I will say immediately that the shadow of the cross looms large over every verse in this psalm. So take heart. It's going to be a fun journey. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We have sung of you. Our hearts are glad. Lord, we long to see you in your word. Lord Jesus, in Luke 24, to your beleaguered disciples who didn't quite understand the scope and the totality of Scripture, after your resurrection, you came to them, and it says you opened the entirety of the Bible, the Old Testament, to them, Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, and showed them yourself. And when they saw you in the Old Testament, Lord, they said, our hearts burned within us. So, Lord, I pray that perhaps some of my brothers and sisters came in as a smoldering flax today. There is a fire there but it's flickering, it's faint because of chronic pain or depression or worry or doubt, demonic oppression, everything in between. Lord, I pray as we see Christ that you would kindle into a full flame again in them and send them out of this place rejoicing and singing of their Redeemer. That's our hope and that's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 18, the title is, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. We sing to Jesus in the Psalms, we sing of Jesus in the Psalms, and we sing with Jesus in the Psalms. 
These words are from a book that has greatly impacted me in my devotional life as well as in my preaching and my teaching. And I'm referring to David Murray's book, Jesus on Every Page, 10 Simple Ways to Seek and Find Christ in the Old Testament. If you don't have this book, I would highly recommend it to you. It is a very easy to understand primer on how do I see Christ accurately throughout my Old Testament. I have a quote on the screen for you because I think this quote from Jesus on every page on his chapter on the Psalms specifically will help if, you, if you're like many believers, they love the Psalms, but when it comes to exegeting the Psalms, because it's a poetic genre, it, it doesn't flow like Romans where it's therefore and because and since, it's, it's a little bit harder to nail down sometimes. I think if you're in that boat, I think this quote will help frame as you come to the Psalms this summer. Uh, to give some sort of interpretive grid. How do I rightly handle the Psalms and see Christ there? So follow with me. I think this is helpful. David Murray says this, Think of how we can use the different kinds of Psalms to praise Jesus. We use the Psalms of lament to confess our sins to Jesus. We sing the Psalms of praise to celebrate Jesus' person and work. We sing the Psalms of remembrance to look back on Jesus' acts throughout redemptive history. We sing the psalms of confidence to express our faith in Jesus' salvation. We sing the wisdom psalms to acknowledge that Jesus is our only source of wisdom. We sing the psalms of thanksgiving to express our gratitude for Jesus' daily grace in our times of need, end quote. In Psalm 18, I believe that we can sing of our Redeemer in some very unique ways. Psalm 18 is a song of deliverance, and there's a direct parallel in 2 Samuel 22. So if you look at 2 Samuel 22 in the historical context of these things and flip back and forth, you'll see that it's very, very similar. If you look at the heading, or what they call the superscript, above in Psalm 18, before verse 1, there's a little chunk there, probably in all caps, called the superscript. It says this, To the choir master, a psalm of David the servant of the Lord who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So there, I want you to keep one eye, as we, as we work through Psalm 18, keep one eye on the historical context, which is the deliverance of David from the hand of Saul. That is the historical context of what is being said here. But in light of what we've seen from David Murray, I think we need to keep one eye as well trained on the cross. Because in this song of deliverance sung by David, we hear loud echoes of a greater song of deliverance from David's heir. Dr. James Hamilton says it this way, and I, I couldn't improve on it, so I'll just quote it. He says, like the song of Moses sung after Yahweh's victory at the Red Sea, we sing the song of David in Psalm 18 in celebration of Yahweh's victory at the cross. So if you will, go to the very last verse of Psalm 18. It's, it's kind of a giveaway. It's like an Easter egg. It's right there. Psalm 1850. David is already looking ahead to, you see a, a word there in verse 50, great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his what? Offspring. Already this psalm is pushing us forward. Yes, there's a historical reality to it, but there's already a built-in anticipation that this is pointing us forward to the offspring of David. And because we have the whole Bible in front of us, and we, we can read it backwards, we go, I know who that is. And so we come to Psalm 18 with gospel lenses. And Psalm 18 is a song, and so we'll treat it like a song. Psalm 18 is a gospel song, and it has two choruses and four verses. So we'll begin with chorus one. Look at verses one through three. Chorus one of this gospel song about the offspring of David. Verses one through three begins, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, and whom I take refuge. These are all military terms. This is strong. My shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. 
and I am safe from my enemies. In the mid-90s, the superstar group Blues Traveler wisely told us that the hook brings you back. I can tell who's my age. You're nodding, and the millennials are like, what? What they meant was that every good song requires a catchy chorus, a hook, a refrain. It brings you back. Psalm 18 anticipates the work of the greater David, and its opening verses are like a hook that the whole song kind of comes back to. I love you, Lord, for you have saved me from all my enemies. David uses a unique phrase here in verse 1. A lot of times we're talking about Yahweh's love for his people, and rightly so. This is one of those rare occasions where David is emphatically saying, this is a human love for you. I love you, God, and I'm going to sing about it. He acknowledges that God alone, not military might or personal strength or anything else, God is, as you scan these opening verses, it is his rock, his fortress, his deliverer, his refuge, his shield, his horn, his stronghold. And David sums it up in verse 3. He says in the present tense, for I am saved from my enemies. This is a very happy man in the Lord. In the superscript, the heading, it says, the servant of the Lord. And if we know our Bibles, we can't help but say, I think that, yes, David, historically, but that servant of the Lord, I know, is the offspring of verse 50, who is the one prophesied in the book of Isaiah. There's only one servant of Yahweh. There's only one true servant of God, and that's the greater son of David. And there is only one man who could truly say, I love you, Lord, and say it with a full heart, because the Lord Jesus is the only man who ever walked this planet who loved his God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength impeccably. So here we sing of Jesus, and in a sense, we sing with him. Because the Psalms was our Lord's songbook as well. Where else did he get those words on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me if not Psalm 22? Jesus bled the Psalms. So join me in singing of our Redeemer as we come to verse 1 of our gospel song. Verse 1, for my note takers, we sing of his suffering. We sing of his suffering. Look at verse 4. We're looking at verses 4 through 15. 4 through 15. Here, David uses poetic imagery to describe his struggle with Saul. Verse 4, he mentions the cords of death. In verse 4 as well, he mentions the torrents of destruction. Imagine being just wave after wave after wave. In verse 5, he mentions the cords of Sheol. Imagine like a net dragging you down to the pit of the earth. In verse 5, he says, it was the snares of death. Clearly, he was surrounded by people who wanted to do him harm without a just cause. Now, I found it interesting as I researched this text that one commentator argues that David here, in verses 4 and 5 specifically, is using these terms to describe the evil spiritual forces that influenced his human enemies, something like Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. David is literally being threatened by the powers of hell. Yes, there's human agency. There's Saul and his army, but he knows that there is a power behind this. Friends, at this point already, how can we not see our glorious, suffering Redeemer in this passage? Look at verse 6. He says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. Look at the verbiage of verse 7. The earth reeled and rocked, and it trembled, and it quaked. In verse 9, it says, smoke went up from his nostrils, thick darkness under his feet. And jump down to verse 13 hailstones and coals of fire. If we know this is a Jesus psalm, we know that David's poetic language perfectly describes the anguish of Jesus as he bore the Father's wrath on the cross. 
no less surrounded by enemies, no less surrounded by the hordes of hell. And we see here darkness and hailstones and quaking and earthquakes, and immediately our minds go to Matthew 27 where we read this, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And lo and behold, the earth shook and the rocks were split. Here we sing of our Redeemer, the one who suffered in our place. Do you, do you see the relevancy of this psalm? It's a big psalm. It's easy to kind of just skip through, but this is our salvation being wrought in prophetic fashion. And not only that, in verse 15, you hear echoes of the Exodus. He says, the channels of the sea were seen your mind should snap back to Exodus 15 and you go, whatever's happening in Psalm 18, it's like a new Exodus. So at this point, because we know who this is ultimately pointing to, the offspring of David, the new Moses, the greater Moses, the greater David, I have to ask, has this new and greater Moses, this offspring of David, has he redeemed you from the slavery of, of sin and the wrath of God. If we look back to all these scary imagery of verses 6 and 7 and 8 and 9, we realize that this is a snapshot of the wrath of God against sin. If we look at verses 4 and 5, the cords of death and destruction and hell, the wages of sin is that. That's what's hanging over us. And so at this point, it's not just a cute psalm, it's my story. You go, that's me, that's the sin in my life, that's the death I deserve, that's the hell that is yawning to swallow me up. I'm so thankful that there is one here in my place. Because now I sing not only of my sin, but I'm singing of the suffering of another that took my place. So verse 1 we sing of his suffering. And then verse 2, we sing of his sinlessness. We sing of his sinlessness, verses 16 through 30. In verse 16, David begins to rejoice over being delivered. So we see, historically, I was surrounded, biblically, with an eye to the gospel. We see the suffering of the offspring of David. But now he says in verse 16, he took me. He drew me out. There's that Moses imagery again being drawn out. He rescued me, verse 17. Verse 18, the Lord was my support. So I'm tracking. Yahweh came to your rescue. But then David says something starting in verse 20 that is shocking. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. This is David, by the way. Just keep your eyes on 20 to 24. His statutes I did not put away. I was blameless before him. I kept Myself from guilt, the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness and the cleanness of my hands. And so I look at verses 20 through 24 and I say, how can David utter these words? Moreover, how could you or I say something like that? The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. I have never put away his statutes. One thing to remember, David is talking about the immediate context. David is saying, as far as Saul is concerned, I've done him no wrong. So we grant him that. We won't pick on David too much. We, we see what you're saying. You're not, you're not claiming a, a total innocence 
Like you're some sort of angelic figure. We, we know your story, David. But he's saying, when it comes to this instance, I am, I am free of guilt. Granted. But David was still a sinner, even if he did no wrong to Saul. Do you think that he was sinless, perfectly sinless, perfectly righteous, but then the whole Bathsheba thing came? No, that was just an occasion for what was already in his heart to come out. David already said in another psalm, he was brought forth in iniquity. He was a sinner from the get-go. You may have clean hands when it comes to how Saul treated you, but you don't have clean hands in life. Beloved, you and I might be innocent of certain charges, and we are. There are times where we can say, Lord, I didn't do it. But we know that inherently we are sinful to the core. We are far from the perfect righteousness that God demands. And we have to ask ourselves, look at verses 25 through 30. These are all the blessings that God poured out on David. Verse 25, he says, I have received mercy. And verse 27, I have received salvation. And verse 28, the light of God. And verse 29, victory. And verse 30, I find in him a refuge. Friends, our hands, our hands are not clean. Our good works are not righteous. We need a sinless substitute. We need someone in our place who could actually say these things. We need someone who could actually say, I have never broken the law of God. My hands, these nail-pierced hands are clean, never defiled. This mind never sullied. This body always consecrated. And we need that one to stand in our place. And that's exactly what we find Praise the Lord. 1 Peter 2, he committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. This is the doctrine of imputation. This is what Brother Alex was saying before with 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see how personal Psalm 18 is for the believer that comes in under a weight of guilt. All you can see, you're trying to see Jesus, but everything in between is nothing but sin and infraction. What do you need to know? Because you want to be able to say, my hands are clean. I love you, Lord, but you just can't sing it because you're missing the gospel. So we come back to Psalm 18 and we say, this is Christ. His hands are clean, law kept perfectly, and by faith in him, all of that credited to you by grace. This is your song. Stop Going out of here thinking, I need to do more. You need to believe more. The doing will come. We sing of his suffering. We sing of his sinlessness. Verse 3 of our song, we sing of his supremacy. This is verses 31 through 42. Now David begins to sing about how God rescued him from Saul. But since we know this psalm ultimately is pointing us to David's offspring, we can't help but think of Christ's victory, namely his resurrection. As we hear David say things like this, we're listening to David saying, yes and amen, David, but but your offspring had such a greater victory, and that victory by faith is mine. So I'm going to listen to both. David says, verse 33, he set me secure on the heights. Verse 34, he trains my hands for war. Verse 35, your right hand supported me. Verse 37, I pursued my enemies and I overtook them. Verse 38, I thrust them through. Verse 39, you equipped me with strength for the battle. Verse 40, those who hated me, I destroyed. 
Verse 42, I beat them fine as dust before the wind. Whatever is happening here is 100% total victory. And my goodness, does this not sound like Colossians 2.13? And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Hear this. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's the victory I see when I look at Psalm 18, 31 through 42, and it makes me want to say, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph or his foes. And praise the Lord, his victory is our victory. Do you see the gospel flow of Psalm 18 where we have the sinless lamb, we have the cross, we have the resurrection? Look at verse 38. He says, they fell under my feet. They fell under my feet. Does that not make us think of the promise of Genesis 3.15, that the coming offspring of David would be the one to crush the head of the serpent underfoot? Psalm 18 teaches us how to sing of our Redeemer, but Sometimes our own words and our own songs will work pretty well, too. When I read this passage about the utter victory and conquest of David, but ultimately of his offspring, I think of an old song that often gets overlooked, Isaac Watts. He wrote a song called Hosanna to Our Conquering King. It goes like this, Hosanna to our conquering king, the prince of darkness flies. His troops rush headlong down to hell like lightning from the skies. Thy victories and thy deathless fame through the wide world shall run and everlasting ages sing the triumphs thou hast won. Psalm 18, 31 through 42, yes, the Lord delivered David, but we sing of the supremacy and the total victory over death, hell, and the grave of our Redeemer. We sing of his suffering, his sinlessness, his supremacy, and in verse 4 of our song, we sing of his sovereignty. We sing of his sovereignty. This is verses 43 through 48. King David is very uh, poignantly pointed out that by God's grace and by God's empowerment, he was successful in battle. And David indeed conquered many nations. But then we hear the brakes lock and the tires screech with the whole incident with Bathsheba. In these verses, 43 through 48, we hear him praise God for all these victories. But we read our Bibles as a completed reality, and we know tragedy is coming for King David. And this is why we should read these verses with an eye toward the risen, and not only risen, but ascended, never-failing king of the universe. Look what it says in verse 43. And we have to ask ourselves, when did David ever see this kind of universal conquest? 43, you made me the head of nations. People whom I had not known served me. Verse 44, foreigners came cringing to me. Verse 47, you subdued peoples under me. Beloved, David never saw this kind of sovereign power and victory in total, but but his offspring in verse 50 certainly did. When I read this, I hear another echo in my other ear, and that is Matthew 28, where the Lord Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Look at verse 44 here. 
David says that foreigners will come. Well, my mind immediately says, David, you tasted something of this, but not on a universal cosmic scale. Foreigners coming to pay homage to the king. Immediately, my mind goes to Acts chapter 8, where lo and behold, one of the first converts, one of the first trophies of grace of the gospel was none other than a foreigner, an Ethiopian, and not only a foreigner, but an unclean eunuch. We see the fulfillment of verse 44 in Acts chapter 8 when it says, And the Ethiopian eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. He could have done that from Psalm 18. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And I want to say, everything prevents you from being baptized into the holy triune name of Yahweh. You're a foreigner. You're a non-Jew. You're a eunuch. You're defiled. You're mutilated. Everything would say, don't come near the holy name of God if it weren't for the reality of Psalm 18 that points us to Jesus that says, come to the water. Come take my yoke upon you. I call every nation. I see the Ethiopian eunuch here, and I say, praise the Lord. That's me. I'm a foreigner. I'm unclean. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a, never kept the law for two seconds. When I see this kind of conquest happening by the offspring of David here in Psalm 18, I see my own salvation. And I have to ask you, has this sovereign king subdued you? under his gentle yoke? Have you gladly become a trophy of his grace? And if you haven't, do it today. Come to Christ. And in him, repent, believe, and you too can say, my hands are clean. Not because they are actually clean, but because I wear the garments of another who gladly gave his life to purchase that for me. And every verse in Psalm 18 is calling you, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus. Beloved, look at verse 44. It says, foreigners will come cringing to me. That is a proper posture. When the gospel comes to us, we hear the thunderings of the beginning of Psalm 18. When the, when the spirit begins to awaken you, it awakens you with a reality of sin and earthquakes and lightning flashes and nostrils flaring with the wrath of God and all of these things that should make us cringe and hide. But there's one thing that can woo us out of our fortress of self-righteousness and subdue us, and that is a picture of a suffering Savior who holds out nail-pierced hands, who says, I've taken the wrath of God. Come! And verse 44 becomes our testimony where we as unclean foreigners, cringing though we are, we come to him and we find a merciful, loving, patient, wrath-enduring Savior who puts his spirit in us that we, the unclean, might be able to say, Abba, Father. This is amazing. Chorus 1, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, chorus 2. Any good song ends with the chorus, right? The hook brings you back. Verses 49 and 50. Begins with a chorus, a declaration. It ends with a declaration. We sing to Jesus in the Psalms. We sing of Jesus in the Psalms. And we sing with Jesus in the Psalms. And in Psalm 18, we have the chance to sing of the glories of our Redeemer, and it closes with the final chorus. Look at verse 50. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. You take those words and just circle them all together and tie a rope around them and pull. King, anointed, offspring, you get Messiah. 
And for those who by faith are united to him, his suffering, beloved, is what we deserved. His victory over death and the devil is freely given to us. His sinlessness becomes ours. His supremacy becomes our delight. His sovereignty becomes our hope. And in Christ and Christ alone, the offspring of David, we can sing the first chorus of Psalm 18. We can go back to the beginning, back to the chorus, back to the hook, and we can sing. But maybe we could sing it this way. Look at verse 1. And as our hearts take in 50 verses of Christ-centered, gospel-rich reality, maybe we can sing something similar, but make it our own. I love you, Lord. 